with us. Uh, I should, uh, as we introduce them, I just want to share a little something with you. The um, uh, uh, last few months, um, I go down into the basement um, a few mornings a week, jump on a stationary bike down there for a little bit of an exercise, you know, trying to uh, slow the inevitable. <clears throat> And um, uh, recently, uh, I've been going to a, a box, and we have many boxes filled with hundreds, if not literally into the thousands, of um, CDs of pastors. And I'll grab one that's, you know, 10, 15 years old, pop it into a, a CD player, and I get blessed. I get so blessed. Um, <clears throat> I first heard Pastor Scott when I was a, a teenager uh, living in central New York. And Pastor Scott would, was broadcasting on a, uh, a series of radio channels. And I've shared this with you, most of y'all, in the past. But um, Pat Robertson, the president of CBN, some of you know CBN, um, he had uh, several radio channels through central New York. And my mom would tune in. I wasn't much interested. But she was. And each noon, he had a prime slot right at noon and on uh <clears throat> i think it was weiv there in um central new york on would come the sword of the spirit broadcast and um some of you have maybe um heard some of those well praise the lord friends <laughs> i'll never do it justice <clears throat> uh on would come the broadcast and uh and that broadcast as i say it's not one that i would listen to but it was used of the Lord to, uh, to be a mighty influence in my life. I didn't know it at the time. But through others uh, that were uh, very affected, very blessed. And I would characterize uh, the ministry. And I am very mindful of, of uh, getting away from here and getting our guest speaker up here. <laughs> but uh, now for a number of decades... <clears throat> uh, the distinguishing feature to my mind has been the, the depth, the clarity, the consistency, the purity, and strict and careful adherence to the full counsel of the Word of God. I've, I've walked with the Lord now for, <clears throat> well, for longer than a number of you have been alive. <clears throat> uh, and I have, have had opportunity to see some exposure to, have some exposure to a number of different ministries. Um, I've been blessed to have been brought up all my Christian walk under Pastor Scott's ministry. And, uh, and yet, uh, fads come along, don't they? You can have somebody that's, um, that, that jumps on the, uh, the uh, they're championing the spirit-filled, and they, they make it all but a, a sideshow with a spectacular, uh, an, an inordinate emphasis on, on uh, something that is just oohing and on the people, and, um, and we lost sight of Jesus. And then there are those that would teach a, a solid word, but it lacks the anointing of, uh, of, the, of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Or you get, uh, certainly there are popular messages that have come down the pike. You know, whether it's just the, uh, the, the believe in you, all the corruption of, of Christian psychology or the, the, the watering down of the word to make it popular and, and palatable to the unregenerate. Uh, there's something real wrong when the word of God or religion is attractive to those people who, who don't love the Lord. But the purity and the consistency now for a good number of decades, <clears throat> it's, a, uh, it's a rich and wonderful blessing. Uh, the role that, uh, that he has played in all of our lives. I've had the blessing of, of, of serving, uh, of being brought up as a believer under Pastor Scott all my Christian white walk in life. And, uh, and it was, we have on our, on our dresser, um, Marianne keeps a picture, our wedding picture. And there are, there are three of us there. <laughs> yep, great picture of just the two of us standing before this man as he, uh, before the Lord joined us. And, and I, I, could, I could so go on about the wonderful blessing and privilege it, it is in and, and so many ways personal and certainly ministerially to have uh, this man uh, as, a, as, as a true pastor and an apostle 
in my life. Uh, <clears throat> his example has just been, been one of such consistent, uh, determined adherence to the purity of God's word and to the heart of God. And uh, I just so thank the Lord for his life. And I'm excited to, to have you pastor with us today. Please come. Thank you, Jesus. The Lord is so good. Amen. Yes. Amen. Yeah, it seems as though the years are going by. <laughs> I've been serving the Lord now for just a little over 50 years. He's never forsaken us, amen? amen? He's so faithful and so good. And the one thing that my mind always goes to and has been preeminent in our lives and in our ministry is the expecting of the imminent return of the Lord. Jesus is coming back soon, amen? amen. The old chorus, soon and very soon, we're going to see the king, praise God. And you know, the Bible says in 1 John that there should be a, a thankfulness in our hearts because of that awareness. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Amen? Amen. And it doesn't yet appear what we shall be. But we know this, that when he appears, we're going to see him and we're going to be like him. Hallelujah. I'm too far away from what he looks like. I've got so much to learn. I've got so much growth that's necessary yet in my life. But I want you to know that the scripture teaches us very clearly. We are predestined to be conformed to the image of Jesus. Amen? Amen, amen? I don't know about you, but I battle every day. Every time I wake up and look in the mirror, there he is. <laughs> My number one enemy. Amen? My number one enemy isn't the devil. My number one enemy is the flesh. Amen? amen? For in me that is in my flesh, the scripture says, dwells no good thing. Wake up every morning, look in that mirror and say, you no good thing, amen? Now, many of us have been taught, of course, through the confession teaching to confess who we are in Jesus Christ, and that is very biblical. Confessing new cars is not. Confessing better jobs is not. But confessing who we are in Jesus Christ is the foundation of us being able to stand and finish this race that we're in. Amen. And so we look and, and we just expect every day that trumpet to sound, the trumpet of God, amen, that blast. Revelation gives us a little insight into what that trumpet's going to sound like. It's a voice that sounds like a trumpet. The words spoken that sound like a trumpet are come up hither, praise God. Amen. 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 We're going to hear it soon. And the dead in Christ will rise and will be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at that last trump, praise God. Just think about that. And then we'll get to see him. And we will be like him. What a great word to us this morning. And we want to take a little bit of time and look at that aspect of it, of that conforming into his image. What does it look like to be conformed into the image of Jesus? It's going to be an instantaneous conclusion at our glorification. Thank God for our justification, and we'll probably talk about that a little bit. Thank God for our justification. Aren't you glad today that you stand justified by the blood of Jesus Christ? Amen. Amen. Pronounced righteous. I'm right with God. Amen. I'm messed up, but I'm right with God. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. <laughs> you all smiling like you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> We, we like to let people try to put on that, that we ain't messed up. But we're messed up. 
Because in me, that is in my flesh, say it, no good thing, man. We are hopeless without him. Without him, we can do nothing, the scripture says, but thank God we got him, and I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. Amen? Amen. That verse there in Philippians is a very key verse to walking a sanctified life, to walking in holiness. And that's what we want to talk about a little bit this morning, just being able to finish this course, knowing that we're walking in a way that's pleasing to God, that we're walking in right relationship, that we have that peace of God that passes all understanding, that there is therefore now no condemnation to us who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Amen? Amen. For what the flesh could not do and that it was weak through ego, self-will, Ambition. Well, let's just get right down to it. Pride. Amen. 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 You know, the one thing that I'm so thankful for, I couldn't believe how long it had been since we had been here in a, in a role of just sharing the word. And some of you weren't alive. And as I was asking Jim before the service, I said, how long has it been? And, and he told me, and I just blamed it on Alzheimer's <laughs> that I couldn't remember. <laughs> you know, we will have been ministering here at Calvary Temple now in a month or so celebrating our 50th anniversary. You. you know, you don't find many pastors that stay at a church for 50 years. Well, the reason is because most of them are congregational and they kick them out before then. <laughs> I had a friend of mine, Leo Price, an evangelist. He used to travel the country. He had a <clears throat> pretty well-known ministry for a while and he called me and he said, Star, he said, uh, I'm leaving the church here, I'm pastor. And I said, really? I said, what's wrong, Leo? And he said, well, illness and fatigue. And I said, really? He said, yeah, they're sick and tired of me. <laughs> <laughs> and so, praise God, the people have been gracious to us. We've seen a lot of great things happen in 50 years. And your pastor is one of them. And I'm not one that flatters a lot. But the one thing in your pastor and the one thing I would like to just share that you, I'm sure, already know your pastor's not only a gift. Paul speaks of it, that there were gifts given unto men, Jesus said. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. You're blessed here. You're not only being cared for a shepherd that's a gift of God, He's a man of God, and there's a difference. And you ought to thank God and pray for him, and there's a lot of warfare that goes on in the oversight of souls. You're going to stand before God and give an answer someday. And that's why I've tried, and as Pastor was sharing this morning, to always make sure, I, I live, I've lived 50 some years looking to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. I've been a lot of places, done a lot of things, uh, seen a lot of miracles, power of God. 
thousands filled with the Holy Spirit, thousands healed. It's been an interesting life, actually. It's been an interesting ride because it's all God's grace and mercy. You're just going for the ride. It has nothing to do. God speaks out of donkeys, so I qualify. <laughs> I used to have a big fro. Anybody here remember the fro? <laughs> yeah, if you had a big afro back in the day. Today, it'd be kind of like a, I don't know, <laughs> a pitiful looking little thing, but I used to go to a lot of holiness churches. We'll be talking a little bit about the holiness in this. And you know, the holiness churches, they were a lot to do with the outward. You know, how you dressed and women were not to wear pants and you weren't to cut your hair. The women were to let their hair grow long and they'd wrap them up in a bun, you know, and stack them on their heads and couldn't wear makeup. I agree with the philosophy. If the barn needs painting, paint it, <laughs> you know, so. Uh, but a lot of outwardness. And so I'd go into some of these churches and, you know, I had this afro and people were taken back by that in some of these holiness churches. So I just reminded them, listen, God spoke out of a bush before. He can do it again. <laughs> praise God. <laughs> Amen. And I've always been jealous that it would be the word of God. I want to hear well done, good and faithful servant. I lived, really, it, it was a, a godly fear, but I, I lived in fear of ever misrepresenting God. I've been saved over 50 years, and I've misrepresented God many times in my life. I failed God in the way I live, the way I think. But I can stand before you this morning and to the best of my knowledge, I've never failed him in representing his word accurately. I won't speak anything except what the word of God speaks. And I won't move off of it for any man. I have no fear of men's faces when it comes to opposition to the word of God. Amen. Let God be true and every man a liar. And many of the hard things that we've had to teach over the years, we've had to experience. As it comes to taking a stand for the word of God and righteousness and holiness, having to mark my own flesh and blood and turn them over to Satan for the destruction of their flesh. Having to make stands for the word of God that would cost us. Many years ago in our school in Sterling, we were one of the fastest growing schools at that time. And we had to make a decision because I saw that what we were doing wasn't pleasing God. As soon as I saw it in the scriptures, how can two walk together except they be agreed? We had people coming from other schools and other churches but how can you walk together except you be agreed? How can we have Baptist kids and Presbyterian kids coming in and sitting down at chapel and are cessationists? They don't believe that, that the gifts of the Spirit are for today. Amen? So I finally stood up one day, and we were, we were in some financial stress at that particular time. We were trying to build buildings at that time. We, there was people that were leaving the church, at that particular time, and the Lord spoke clearly to me. And I just let everybody know that starting next semester, the attendance will be by invitation only, and that no one who was not a part of our fellowship was going to be welcome. We lost a lot of money. You know, Christian education is a very profitable business. Not everybody gets blessed 
like those that are here among us. The average Christian uh, down where we live right now, the average tuition, uh, I think, is around $8,000 a year per student, something in that area. Aren't you glad that we can fellowship and serve in the fellowship? People that love our kids that are among us, amen? Amen. amen? That are giving out of their hearts. And that our kids are being raised up and second to none. Our kids are going out and, and getting some of the highest paying jobs. God's opening doors because of their character. I'm a little bit off right now. We're talking about holiness, but it has to do with the same subject. I had a guy challenge me years ago. And he said, uh, I want to ask you why you're not accredited why this school's not accredited. And it was an official uh, back in the earlier days that we were dealing with. And I said, well, to be very frank, I said, the Bible says the greater, the lesser is blessed by the greater. And I said, we don't recognize your accreditation as being a high enough standard for us. And in fact, what we're producing is 10 times better than what you're producing, according to Daniel. Amen? Amen. And I believe that, and I see it in the fruit of our young people. The passage we want to go to this morning, go ahead and turn to Corinthians, if you would. And we're going to look at 2 Corinthians chapter 7. And the one thing that should be very clear to us in this hour is that God is preparing a holy people, a spotless bride for this hour. Amen? Amen. The Lord's coming back, and he's coming back for a church that's without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. Praise God. I'm falling down in the air of wrinkles on the outside, but on the inside, praise God, I'm being straightened out. Amen. 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 Renewed day by day. But he's coming for a holy church. And holiness is not just moral purity. To be holy means literally to be separate to be unique. When the Bible talks about God's holiness and the, and the created beings crying, holy, 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 it's not about just a moral purity. It's about a uniqueness. We are a peculiar people. We are a holy nation. Amen? Amen. We're going to see here in Corinthians, come out from among them, be separate, saith the Lord. Touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. And you'll be my children. I'll be your father, praise God. But you got to stop thinking like them. Have you seen the new commercials today? You know, uh, the term just went out of my mind right now, but the Jesus understand. He gets us. He gets us. He gets us because he created us. Amen. Amen. Thank God for that. He gets us. But the problem is we're in in a world today where the church is creating Jesus in man's image. And yet they're using all of the Christian jargon. Being born again to much of the church today doesn't mean what it means to you and I. It means to be enlightened or to come into a greater understanding. We know that to be born again means to be recreated. Amen? Amen. We know that to be born again means old things pass away. All things become new, praise God. 
Let this mind be in you, which is in Christ Jesus, the admonition is. The infiltration of the world into the church's thinking today. In the last days, false prophets will arise, the scripture says. Men will no longer be enduring sound doctrine. And I believe that we as the church, more than ever, have got to establish this foundation of the truth of the word of God. Let God be true and every man a liar. And we're to hold one another accountable. Listen, it's not enough for you to be pursuing your personal sanctification. We need to, according to Ephesians, see what's being spoken in the areas of false doctrine. The woke movement, the woke church. Woke nothing. If Jesus were to appear right now, he would say like he did to the disciples. You remember he told them, watch with me, pray with me. Amen? Amen. And he went back to pray and he came back and they were asleep. And the question, the reproof that was brought, can't you watch with me one hour? You know, we don't have much longer in this race. Don't faint now. Amen? Amen? Having done all to stand, stand, praise God. This is a time to become more diligent. To press toward the mark, the prize, the high calling of God that's in Christ Jesus. Forgetting the things that were behind, Paul said. One thing many of us it would behoove us to do is forget our successes at this moment. Oh, there's a time to look back at the memorials and boast in God and the great successes. But here's the thing that the Lord asked, when I come, will I find faith on the earth? You see, many of us have made habits. We get up and do our devotions every morning. Are we reading the word in faith? Or are we going through our devotions? Are we coming to church by faith? Or are we coming by habit? Are we coming just by obedience? Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is, and even more as you see that day approaching. Or are we coming in faith? Are we believing God to come into these meetings and transform us? Amen? Amen? Are we believing God that he will visit us in our prayer closets and transform us? That regeneration, that new creation would continue to manifest itself in sanctification. That our lives are truly set apart for God. Let's make sure we're not found as earth dwellers in this hour. Any of you uptight about the economy? Any of you uptight about, you know, the, what lies ahead for some of our young couples and, you know, what we're believing God for? Let me tell you what to believe God for. Believe God for the grace to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and you won't have to worry about anything else. Amen? Amen? Sanctified living, holy looking to God. And we think that we can, or we believe that we can be holy believing in God, but that we have a little bit over here that we can contribute that will help him out. This is my help God out for when he gets weak fund. Are we really walking in biblical sanctification in this hour? We're hearing all of this talk with among religious people. 
And the talk about their new Jesus is Jesus they've created in their own images. I won't get off on it, but Romans chapter 1, we all know it, talks about the fact that they didn't want to retain God. Amen? So they created idols in their own image after their own likeness. Have you heard anybody say in these days, you know, it's interesting to me, well, my Jesus would never do that. That, that one of those He Gets Us commercials says something about uh, the family. And it says, Jesus disagreed with, but never forsook his family. He said, if you don't forsake your family, you're not worthy of me. Amen. Amen? Amen. He did say with his mother and brothers present, who are my mother and my brothers? These that do the will of God. And we're just saying that this spirit, this, this time where the church is creating a new Jesus. Let me remind you that Paul said, if anybody brings another gospel other than that that I've brought to you, let him be anathema, maranatha. Damned to hell. Not just write them a letter and say, well, I disagree with your theology. When's the last time you were out ministering to somebody and they were sharing another Jesus and you, rec and you recognize it and you share to them in love? Brother, be careful here. The Bible says, man, there's only one truth. There's only one Gospel, there's only one way. Latest survey taken, 60% of professed evangelicals say there's more than one way to God. Evangelicals go to church every Sunday. I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but by me. There is no other name under heaven whereby men can be saved but the name of Jesus. Amen? Amen. We're on the verge. We're talking about sanctification, about being set apart for God's service. Sanctification is not just leaving the world. It's coming into full-time commitment and service to God. You're not sanctified unless your whole being is given to the kingdom of God, to his work, to his glory, to his greatness. And so here we are in this hour, and he's coming for this spotless bride. And we're living in an hour that's demanding compromise. We are just this far from having, and some jobs are not allowing it right now, from having what we call evangelism, the fulfilling of the Great Commission to go into all the world and preach the gospel, your sharing Jesus will be a hate crime very soon, sooner than you can possibly imagine. There was a summit that just dismissed where all of the most powerful men in the world were just gathered. I know someone that was there personally. And they said in this summit, these men are controlling the world. They said in this summit, we have got to do away with free speech. Now, there's only one bastion of free speech that's really left. Well, it is gone. We no longer 
are free in America. I remember when you were really free, you know, but I was telling some of the young kids the other day, I can remember being free. I, rem I remember the first loitering sign that I ever saw, $25 fine for throwing something out of your car. Now, I'm glad that we don't do that anymore. Some of you are too young to, we'd be, you'd drive down the highway, pew, milk, milkshake container, pew, pew, just that people today, kids would gasp and faint and fall over, you know, and, uh, in, in our generation. But there were no regulations. I was looking at a picture the other day. We're getting ready to head out west. I'm going to help my brother with a, a move out there. And I saw an old picture of someone standing on the very tip of El Capitan, 1,000 feet straight down. And they're just standing out there looking. <laughs> People out there. There were no restrictions. You could go wherever you wanted, do whatever you wanted. I remember what it meant to be free. They didn't bubble wrap you <laughs> against your will. You will not approach this sure death vehicle. It will eliminate every child from the face of the earth if you allow them to get on that tricycle without a helmet. <laughs> All will die. How'd I get over there? Regulation, free speech. Everyone being demanded. Allowed to believe, but not allowed to live or declare your belief. Some of you are going to have decisions to make whether you keep your job or not. If you don't love me, more than mothers and fathers and houses and lands, yea, in your own life also, you are not worthy of me. Amen? Amen? You ready to give up your job tomorrow? Don't you ever share the gospel with anybody in this place again or you're fired. Let me throw another kicker on that just to make it more palatable. In 30 days, you get to retire. So surely we would think, I'll be quiet for 30 days, and then I'm out of here. Is that a sanctified mind? No. Do you know some would call it wisdom? I would call it disobedience. You see, it's interesting when we talk about being committed to the kingdom of God, when we talk about living lives that are separate from the world, it's different at crunch time. It's great for conversation. It's great for declared outward holiness. But what's in our hearts? We're the decisions that we've made early. Many of you have made decisions very similar. I know when I first got saved, I was a young man, 20 years old, and, and at that particular time, making a decision for Jesus Christ, I lost my family. I can still remember like yesterday, I called my parents and I began to share the gospel with them, told them that I'd just been born again.
I won't use the same verbiage that my father used. But he then made the statement. He said, you either choose this Jesus nonsense or you choose your family. If you choose Jesus, we don't know you. Isn't it interesting? We mark somebody today and that's okay. I mean, that's not okay, right? We mark them and say they're in the church and they're living contrary to the gospel and they're not a part of the community and we mark them and cast them out. And these same people that mark their kids and cast them out don't think anything's wrong with it from that perspective. The world understands that. They just don't understand it when the church does it for the glory of God. I'd only been saved just a short period of time. And I remember telling him, Dad, just want you to know this. I love you, but this is no choice. You didn't die for my sins. I choose Jesus. So we asked the question this morning, who died for our sins? We are not our own. We're bought with a price, the precious blood of Jesus. Amen. And so we look here at the second Corinthians and in chapter seven, we'll get to that. It's very, it's very difficult. I, there's no way in two sessions that I can teach a specific lesson I could, but we'll just take the shotgun version as I'm just sharing some of the things that I believe are real to us at this particular moment. Amen. And I was just looking at, at the 1230s, the official time. <laughs> I've, been, I, I've been teaching... I've actually purposely cut back my teachings to 45 minutes. Now, I'm not suggesting anything for pastor. Amen. <laughs> I have noticed, though, when I was younger, I used to teach longer. I was at one of the meetings in New York that he was talking about one of the churches in New York. And this guy was just as serious as a heart attack, man. He came up after the service. He said, Brother Scott, I just want you to know I enjoyed every hour of that teaching. <laughs> <laughs> and he was serious. We ran off a 120-minute tape and ran out of time. But I had a friend of mine tell me, you know, that the word can be eternal without being everlasting. <laughs> but the one thing I know is it never returns void. Amen. 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 We've already quoted a handful of scriptures this morning that none of them will return void. Every one of them will affect your life and your heart as your spirit man hears that word of God and identifies with it because his sheep know his voice and another they will not follow, praise God. What can we do to protect our hearts, our loved ones in this hour? To not compromise in the last hour, in the twelfth hour. I'm throwing out a lot of subjects. One of them is to put a watch over our mouths. Don't let Satan in here to have anything to do with strife and bitterness and criticism and backbiting. Amen? Amen. Paul says in Ephesians concerning those different things, those great evils of speech that is corrupting. He said, don't let these things even be once named among you. I talked to you about the old time Pentecostals and their outward dress and their outward holiness. The only problem 
inwardly was they had tongues that could wrap around this gym. And their little pettiness and their gossip and their criticisms. As we look at this hour, the problem and what we're facing as a people and need to guard ourselves again, most of us here will not find ourselves back on drugs, back on drink, carousing. What begins to happen in these last days is we begin to think more highly of ourselves than we ought to think. We begin to think that somehow experience in and of itself creates character. Character is manifest daily by choice. Amen? We are what we are in our next decision at the next moment. Thank God that experience does us well. We learn and, and, and by reason of use, the scripture says, our senses are exercised to discern good and evil. Thank God for those victories that are won. We don't trust in the past victories. We trust in the presence of God that gave us those victories. And that, pres that presence is something that is manifest tangibly, specifically at the moment. Let me speak to it in the negative too. Stop thinking about and dwelling upon your failures. Our faith is sufficient in him for this hour and this moment. Amen. Amen. So this seventh chapter coming off of the the 16th verse of the previous chapter what agreement has the temple of God with idols for you are the temple of the living God as God has said I will dwell in them and I will walk in them and they will be my God they should be there my people wherefore come out from among them be separate saith the Lord Touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. I will be a father unto you. You shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord God Almighty. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. There's a cleansing that has to deal with flesh and there's a cleansing that has to do with the spirit man. And let me tell you, the flesh man is easier to deal with than the spirit man. This spirit man who begins to be corrupted through wrong thinking, through false doctrine, through this Jesus that if we're not careful, we begin to create in our own image. My Jesus would not do that. What does your Jesus look like? Is he the Jesus of humanism? You know, we talk about today, you know, uh, one of the great problems in America is racism. Well, first of all, there is no such thing as racism. Racism does not exist at all, ever ha has or ever will. There's only one race, it's the human race, and Adam is our father. Amen? Amen. Amen. Now, if you want to talk about cultures or ethnicity, that's another thing. But it's not a race problem. The one race, the human race, has a real problem, and that's sin. Amen. And it's in every man. Amen? And so we realize then that we have two problems. Anything that we might say about the conflict through ethnicity that's in our existence comes back to one thing, and that is a sin problem. If you're a Christian, if you're born again, there aren't any problems. We understand there's not Jew, there's not Gentile, there's not male, there's not female, amen? There's sinners and there's believers, and that's all that, that really can have for a demarcation 
in the world today. People trying to make us today believe somehow that the white devil's worse than the black devil. <laughs> it's the devil. And so when we're, when we're looking at, at society today, if we're not careful, it'll influence our lives. There is no racism in the church. There's love. There's unity. We're to endeavor to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. We're talking about being sanctified in our spirits. Amen. How do you think? What influence? I was out, I was out just the other day helping again my brother, and, and he and his wife are these, are these, have turned into these news junkie people. Dear Lord, all they have on is Fox News. Good shot. <laughs> you know, if you listened to Fox News, you would believe God is dead. <laughs> Aren't you thankful for the good news? Amen. 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 You know, we're, we're in a situation in our country today where We've talked about the oppression that's going to come on the church for our obedience to declare the gospel. The church is going to come under some restrictions. The church real soon will have tax exemption removed from it. There's only, there's, there's only one real big pool of money left for the government to get, and that's the money that the church has that is not taxable. And so they're going to come after it and all that you contribute to the church will no longer be tax deductible. Well, that'll affect a lot of people, but not the real church. Amen? There's nobody in here that gives for tax deduction. Well, let me just say, there's no Christians that give for tax deduction. We give out of worship. Amen. Amen. And we don't give to Calvary Temple. We give to the Lord. The tithe is the Lord's. Honor the Lord with the first fruits of your increase. Amen. Amen. So the word dictates everything we do. So the church will be experiencing some of that crunch. I believe that they will actually begin then following that to charge uh, or to tax the churches on their income. And that'll cause a lot of conflict. And then on their holdings, land, properties, etc. We just remodeled uh, the main floors in our facility at home. And it's a very interesting thing having owned all of that property for such a long time, the Lord spoke to us years ago and, and we've been able to pay everything off and own everything. But you know, they can tax you out of business. And here's where I'm going with this. When they come and take this building, then we meet in our homes, amen? Amen.
And when they put pressure on us and we can no longer meet in our homes, we meet out in the fields. And we wander about in animal skins. There's the wrong thinking of the church being raptured at a time of ease and comfort. If we could understand the hatred that Satan has for God's kingdom, the hatred of these men in rule in our nation at this time and around the world, this, this uh, commission that was just meeting, as I'm sharing out of my heart with you. There's an hour coming that none of us have tasted of. And I think this is the time that we've got to come together. I'm trying to think of the best way to, to state this, that as we, as we come out, as the scripture just said, from among them. Do you have confidence in your coworkers? Oh, they're a good friend. They will kill you. Do you have confidence in your natural blood relatives that aren't serving Jesus? They will be the first ones to turn you over because of their hatred for Jesus Christ. Read the scriptures. It's what it says. Are you trying to maintain relationships with family members and co-workers and other people? Let me remind you that Jesus said, I'm coming not to bring peace, but a sword. And I will divide your houses three against two and two against three. That's not a message that the church wants to hear today. It's just the truth. Carnal-mindedness is not just lascivious thinking. It's not covetousness. Carnal-mindedness is not letting the word ring as truth, a clarion call to the will and heart of God that nothing else is given a moment's consideration. I don't have to think about these decisions. I've already made my mind up, amen? Amen. I remember back as a young man and the first time I ever heard that chorus, I'll go where you want me to go. Dear Lord, you all know that one. I'll do what you want me to do. And then the chorus comes in and says, though none go with you, yet I'll follow. No turning back. No turning back. And as I see the day getting closer, all I can say is that I have a greater cry for holiness in my life. A greater cry to be obedient to the will of God. I'm supposed to be headed in May for India and then from there down to Africa. And I'd like to take just a moment to thank those of you who have been praying for us in the book distributions that we've been having. Uh, the Lord is just opening doors beyond our imagination. Uh, last report I got, this will be such a blessing. We've put, uh, I think we have six, six or seven. We might be given five or six. But anyway, a packet of five or six of the books that the Lord put on our heart to get into the hands of young preachers. You know, I still take very personally, I really do. You'll understand what I'm saying here. But it just dawned on me a few months ago that 
Maybe Psalm 71 is closer to reality, but Paul told Timothy, let no man despise your youth. And I've just always lived by that all these years. And then pretty soon I realized I wasn't youth anymore. <laughs> but Psalm 71 went on to say, forsake me not when I'm old and gray headed, forsake me not until I've shown your power to this generation. Amen. Yep. Amen. Willard Canlon, a great man of God from years ago, wrote that best-selling book before the dollar dies. And Willard told me a number of years ago, he said, Star, he said, you've got to get your teachings and writing. He said, you're a dying generation. And I listened to what he said and filed it away. And before you know it, 20 plus years went by. Kind of like when I was here last. It just went by. And, uh, and the Lord spoke to my heart again and, and said, this is the hour. I mean, just boom, do it. And as soon as I said, okay, the Lord began to open doors. I won't go into all of this. We'll maybe share some of this tonight and see if we can actually get into the teaching. Um, <laughs> But as of this moment, it may be just statistics to you, but you can imagine what it means to my heart in being able to fulfill the word of the Lord and hear well done, good and faithful servant. Gur, help me if I miss the numbers a little bit. But at this moment, I believe there's 40,000 senior pastors. They have their own full-time, they have their own congregations throughout India and Kenya and Tanzania, Uganda, South Africa, I can, there's a number of other nations that have these books in hand. And to see pictures of these men, you would think you gave them a bar of gold, man. They can't afford anything. They can't buy books. Let's... We get so insulated, we don't realize how the rest of the world lives. Two billion people wake up starving in the world. Two billion, that's one third of the world's population. But the famine that's in the land though it be a true famine, is not the great famine. Amen? We know the Word of God. The famine is the Word of God in the world today, is what the Scriptures tells us. And to be able to see 40,000 pastors, I think at this point 150,000 or so books that are out, we have another potential 25,000 pastors on this next trip we're going to. Now just think, if their congregations are all just 10 people, lives that are being touched. And so thank you for praying. And it's supernatural. We cannot explain what's happening because we're not making it happen. We're not looking for anything. It just keeps, doors just keep opening. And so, in closing for this morning, I just want to encourage each and every one of us, it's how we finish. Amen? 
I almost feel as the Lord's opened this door like Samson that maybe we're going to do more in our death in these last days than's been done. And we've been so blessed. The miracle of unification of God bringing us together here as a community, each member being intertwined with the life next to him. You don't have any idea how thankful you're going to be for that person in the next seat in the years to come. Not very far off. So be kind with one another. Be gentle. Amen. Amen. Be long-suffering. Some of us don't grow as fast as you. Some of us are just not as committed as you and as spiritual as you and as diligent as you. Some of us are not as learned as you. So be patient with us. We'll catch you at glorification. <laughs> Amen? Amen? So let's walk in love and sanctification as this process continues on. Praise God. Pastor, come and share with us. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Let's stand